this video, we'll look at the basic properties of trig functions. These include domain and range, period, odd and even properties, and much more. Precalculus Online starts now. In section 6.3, we look at the properties of trigonometric functions. And to start this off, you need to do this quick review. And so I'll go ahead and give you a, a few minutes to do that. You'll stop the video here in a second and uh, try to complete this and then answer the questions below. Uh, let me do the first one here for us, though. It says find the reciprocals of each of these numbers. So the reciprocal of 4 fifths is 5 fourths. And then it says draw arcs uh, to connect each number above with its reciprocal, but do not cross the arcs. And the order of the numbers is more important than the scaling, because some of the numbers are going to get really big. So here we have 4 fifths and 5 fourths. So 4 fifths is about right here. I'll go ahead and mark that. And then 5 fourths is going to be about right here. And we want to draw a little arc to connect those. And then you will do the other uh, seven of these problems. And then after you connect those, then answer the questions below. So go ahead and pause the video and complete this task. Now hopefully you had a chance to complete that exercise. Let's go ahead and fill in the reciprocals. The reciprocal of one half is two. The reciprocal of one third is 3, the reciprocal of 1 fourth is 4, the reciprocal of 1 fifth is 5, the reciprocal of 1 tenth is 10, the reciprocal of 1 hundredth is 100, and the reciprocal of 1 thousandth, one thousandth is 1,000. Alright, now let's put these in order. I'll sort of use some different colors here. So, the reciprocal of 1 half is 2. Let me put it right here. And then the reciprocal of 1 third is 3. The reciprocal of 1 fourth is 4. Reciprocal of one fifth is five. The reciprocal of one tenth is ten. Oops, well, that didn't go so well. And then one hundredth is a hundred and for one thousandth would be a thousand. So hopefully you get sort of the gist. None of the arcs cross and they sort of emanate going outward from the number one. The answer to the questions, as the number n gets closer to one, its reciprocal one over n gets closer to so, let me answer this one in red. As your number gets closer to 1, and this could be from either side, the reciprocal also gets closer to 1. So you can see how the, the arcs are sort of coming in toward number 1. So as n gets closer to 1, the reciprocal gets closer to 1. In calculus, you would probably write n approaches 1, and then 1 over n approaches 1 as well. Uh, the next one would be, let me do this in this light blue color, as n gets closer to 0, so now I'm moving closer to 0, the reciprocal 1 over n gets closer to, and this one just sort of goes on forever this way, so as n gets closer to 0, and we're going to assume this is from the positive side, because we're dealing with positive numbers right now, 
then its reciprocal gets closer to infinity. So the closer the number you want to take the reciprocal of gets closer to zero, then the further away it goes and it just sort of explodes on us. In calculus you would write as n approaches zero and to say that it's from the positive side you would use a little plus symbol there. Then 1 over n goes to infinity. And the last one, number 3, as n increases without bound, so that would be going toward infinity, the reciprocal 1 over n goes toward 0. And that's the opposite statement here. As n goes to infinity, then 1 over n approaches 0. And you could even say it approaches from the positive side, but that's okay. So the idea here is the following. As the number n gets closer to 0, the reciprocal grows without bound to infinity. Or if it's getting closer to 0 on the negative side, it goes to negative infinity. And as n increases without bound, the reciprocal gets closer to 0. So there's some... So, sort of related in an inverse type fashion. Let's look at the domain and range of trigonometric functions. So first we're going to list all the trig functions, the unit circle representation on these uh, functions, and the domain and the range for each of these. So the unit circle representation for sine is y. Now this is on the unit circle so it's just y. The domain is everything. So this is sort of basically talking about the angle that you can use with sine. So you can use any angle with sine. And the range is the output. And it tells me what kind of values I get after taking the sine of an angle. Well because the sine is represented by y and on the unit circle, the y's are bounded between negative 1 and 1. Those are the only values you can get. You can get between negative 1 and 1. And there are angles that produce negative 1 and 1, so it's closed at negative 1 and closed at 1. We have a similar situation with cosine. The unit circle representation for cosine of an angle is x. We can use any angle we want, so that's negative infinity to infinity. And the unit circle is bounded in the x direction between negative 1 and 1, so we have negative 1 to 1. Tangent is a little different. The unit circle representation for tangent is y over x. And then the question is, what angles can we take the tangent of? We can take the tangent of all real, all reals, all real numbers, except the odd multiples of pi over 2. And the question is, why is that the case? Well, if I draw a little unit circle right here, the problem is that the tangent is represented by y over x. And so if x is equal to 0, then that's a problem. You can't have that. So the question then becomes, where is x equal to 0? And on the basic unit circle, it's in these two spots. And this is pi over 2, and this is 3 pi over 2, and then if you keep going around the circle, you would have 5 pi over 2 and 7 pi over 2. You could even have negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2, etc. And so it turns out to be all the odd multiples of pi over 2. For the range, you can actually get any number as the result of taking the tangent of some angle. So the range is negative infinity to infinity. Let's look at cosecant. The unit circle representation for cosecant is 1 over y. And what is the domain? It's all reals, except multiples, uh, integer multiples,
of pi. Again, let's look at the unit circle representation. And we have y in the denominator. So if y is equal to 0, that's bad. But where is y equal to 0? In these spots here. At 0 and pi, and then 2 pi, and then 3 pi, etc. And so it's any multiple of pi. The next question is, what is the range of the cosecant function? The range of the cosecant function is based on the range of sine. Because sine is y, the cosecant function is the reciprocal of that. This is why we did the reciprocal exercise to start with. So we know that sines of sine theta range goes from negative 1 to 1. Then what happens to those numbers? Well, let me show you a little diagram down here at the bottom. So let me just split up the sines range right here. Here's negative 1 to 1. I'm going to split that up at 0. And then I'm just going to look at the right side to start with. Any number here that is the result of sine is some y value on the unit circle. And we know now that they split up because of their reciprocal nature going out this way. And then the question is how far do they go? They go out to infinity. But the key here is every number that is in the range of sine, when you take its reciprocal to produce the cosecant, has to go over 1. And so that means for this right-hand side right here, that reciprocal actually goes from 1 to positive infinity. And I can do the same thing on the left side. If I take any number here that's the result of sine, meaning it's the y-coordinate on the unit circle, and I take the reciprocal, it forces it out this way, and that goes on forever, and that makes it from negative infinity to negative 1, and closed at negative 1, because negative 1 is its own reciprocal. So what happens when you find the range of the secant function, you actually start with the whole real line, and you exclude the inside parts between negative 1 and 1. So let's write that down. The range of cosecant is from negative infinity to negative 1, union a positive 1 to infinity. Let's take a look at secant. Secant is 1 over x. So we're going to use the same domain as we did for tangent because of the x in the denominator. So this is all reals except odd multiples of pi over 2. And we have the same scenario for secant as we had for cosecant as far as the range is concerned. It's negative infinity to negative 1 union 1 to infinity. For cotangent we have x over y. Because of the y in the denominator, we have the same domain as cosecant. All reals except integer multiples of pi. And you can in fact get any number as the result of taking the cotangent of an angle. Let's look at periodic functions. A function is called periodic 
if there is a positive number p such that whenever theta is in the domain of p, so is theta plus p and f of theta plus p is equal to f of theta. If there is a smallest number p, this smallest value is called the fundamental period. of f. Now normally we just call it the period and leave it at that. So basically what a periodic function is is something that sort of repeats on a regular basis. So you can think about lunar uh, cycles with the full moon and the new moon and waning moon and stuff like that. That repeats every 28 days so that's the period of the lunar cycle. You can think about the Earth uh, revolving uh, around the Sun. That repeats every 365 or so days. So the period of the Earth revolving around the Sun is 365 days. Uh, trigonometric functions have periods as well. So the trig functions that have a period of 2 pi, in other words they repeat every 2 pi or 360 degrees, is sine, cosine, and their reciprocals secant and cosecant. However, it doesn't take as long for tangent and cotangent to repeat. It only takes pi. So uh, the period of uh, uh, tangent and cotangent is pi or 180 degrees. Now we can use this to solve um, for values when the angle that we're given is much larger than what would be found in the unit circle. For example, Example 1. Find the value of sine of 49 pi over 6. So here's a couple of helpful hints for you to figure out how to do this. Number 1. I would ignore the pi for now and just deal with the fraction. You know, for now. We'll bring the pi back here in a little bit. So ignore pi for now. Now we have to figure out how many rotations, how many revolutions are present inside this angle. So how many times did we have to go around the circle just to get to 49 pi over 6? So to do that, let's divide the fraction out here. And so we're going to take 49 divided by 6. 49 divided by 6 is 8 with a remainder of 1. The period of sine is 2 pi, so I really want to think about this 8 as some multiple of 2. So 8 is equal to 4 multiples of 2. And then that means that we can remove uh, these 4 multiples of 2 from the angle 49 over 6. So let's do that here. So 49 over 6 minus 4 multiples of 2. Now I'm using 2 instead of 2 pi because I'm ignoring the pi's for a moment. So we're going to remove this, uh, these 4 multiples of 2. Well that would be 49 over 6. Uh, 4 times 2 is really 8. 8 times 6 is 48. So this is 48 over 6 and this is 1 over 6. Well, this equation here, this is the same as 49 pi over 6 minus 4 times 2 pi, so there's where the period is, 2 pi, and that's going to be equal to 1 sixth of pi, which is just pi over 6. So using the period information about sine, what we really want here is the sine of 49 pi over 6 is equal to the sine of pi over 6 because of the period. And that would be 1 half. Let's look at example two. Find the value of tangent of 25 pi over four. 
So again, I'm going to ignore the pi, and I'm just going to do 25 divided by 4. That is equal to 6 with a remainder of 1. Now this example is slightly different because the period of tangent is just 1 pi, not 2 pi. So I don't have to worry about 6 being a multiple 2, multiple of 2, even though it is. I'm really just looking for multiples of 1. So we're going to remove 6 times 1 from 25 over 4. So that would give me 25 over 4 minus 6. But 6, when you represent that as a fraction of 4s, would be 24 over 4. And 25 over 4 minus 24 over 4 is 1 fourth. So this is going to be the equivalent of pi over 4 once we bring the pi's back in. So the tangent of 25 pi over 4 is the same as the tangent of pi over 4 once we remove the extra periods. And tangent of pi over 4 is 1. Let's simplify the expression secant of theta plus 12 pi. So we start with secant of theta plus 12 pi. And the period of secant is 2 pi. So we're going to have the secant of theta plus a number of multiples of 2 pi. So 6 multiples of 2 pi. And if you can move, remove 2 pi, you can remove 4 pi, and 6 pi, and 8 pi, and any multiple of 2 pi. So these, this uh, 6 times 2 pi gets removed. And this is just secant of theta. So that's the power of using the period. You can reduce these larger angles down to more reasonable angles and get uh, smaller expressions out of this. Let's examine the sine of the trigonometric functions. So if I draw the grid here, x and y, then we have this little diagram here, A for all trigonometric functions. And what we're describing here is where the positives one, uh, positive trig functions are. So when the trig function results in a positive answer, that's the one we're going to mark here. So all trig functions are positive in the first quadrant. Then uh, sine is positive in the second quadrant. Tangent is positive in the third quadrant, and cosine is positive in the fourth quadrant. If uh, a trig function is positive or negative in some quadrant, then its reciprocal has to be as well. So you also get cosecant is positive in the second quadrant. You also get cotangent is positive in the third quadrant, and secant is positive in the fourth quadrant. Now there's an expression that can help you remember this. You just have to remember that it goes this way around the circle, and that is all students take calculus. A S T C. A strong familiarity with where each of the trig functions is positive and negative will certainly help you in this course. Example 4. If sine of theta is less than 0, which means negative, and cosine of theta is less than 0, also negative, in which quadrant is theta? So one way that you can do this is you can sort of make a little diagram. And I'm going to use red for representing the sine of theta is negative. Well, we know that the sine of theta is represented by the y. So where the 
sine of theta would be negative would be down here in quadrants 3 and 4. And now let me use this blue color to represent where cosine is negative. Well, cosine is represented by x, so we want x is less than 0. So x is less than 0 when it's to the left side of the y-axis. And the question now is which quadrant is double shaded? And that would be right here, quadrant 3. So the answer to this question is quadrant 3. That is the quadrant where the sine of the angle and the cosine of the angle are both negative. Let's look at some identities. So first we have the reciprocal identities. Cosecant of theta is equal to 1 over sine theta. We have secant theta is equal to 1 over cosine theta. And we have cotangent theta is equal to 1 over tangent theta. And then we have the quotient identities. Tangent of theta is equal to sine of theta over cosine theta. And that comes from the fact that tangent of theta is equal to y over x from the unit circle. But y over x is the same thing as y over r divided by x over r and the y over r is sine, and the x over r is cosine. Similarly, the cotangent of theta is equal to cosine theta over sine theta. These identities will help you solve uh, trig function questions uh, without having to draw the complete circle or piggybacking off the circle if you need to. Uh, they provide a handy way to solve some other problems as well. Let's look at example 5. If sine of theta is equal to 1 third and cosine of theta is equal to 2 root 2 over 3, find the other trigonometric functions of theta. So immediately I can go for the cosecant of theta because that is the reciprocal of sine. So that's equal to 1 over sine theta. But that's going to be 1 over 1 third, and the reciprocal of 1 third is 3. So the cosecant of theta is 3. Next, I can ask for the secant of theta. Again, that's just the reciprocal of cosine. And cosine was 2 root 2 over 3. So the reciprocal of 2 root 2 over 3 is 3 over 2 root 2. I need to rationalize the denominator by multiplying by root 2 over root 2. And that gives me 3 root 2 over 4. Next, I can compute tangent of theta. Tangent of theta is the sine of theta over the cosine of theta, which would be 1 third divided by 2 root 2 over 3. Here, the little denominators of 3 cancel. That leaves me with 1 over 2 root 2. Rationalizing again, we get root 2 over 4. Finally, I want to find the cotangent of theta. There are several ways to do this. I think the way I'll choose here is just to use the reciprocal relationship between cotangent and tangent. 
Now you don't have to go back to the final answer for tangent to find an expression that is equal to tangent that's probably more suited to take the reciprocal of. In particular, I noticed that this is equal to the tangent of theta, and this one is, is perfect for taking a reciprocal. So let me use that one. This is going to be equal to 1 over 1 over 2 root 2, but the reciprocal of a reciprocal is just the number itself. So that's just 2 root 2. And that was fantastically easy. Now, could you have taken the reciprocal of root 2 over 4, this guy right here? Sure. But then you'd have to rationalize the denominator again and simplify all of that, and you would still get 2 root 2. So there's, there's not a wrong way to do this. There's maybe just a more elegant way of doing it. Next, let's talk about the Pythagorean identities. So let's develop these from the unit circle. So basically we have this, the unit circle, and I'm just going to pick a representative point, call this theta, the angle, standard position, and then this point here is x comma y. It's a unit circle, so the radius is 1. And we know that the equation of the unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals 1. That's just the equation of a circle centered at the origin with a radius of 1. And if you don't remember that, you can actually very simply draw this uh, altitude here. And then this becomes x, this becomes y and you use the Pythagorean theorem. That's why these are called the Pythagorean identities. But what else do we know about this point? Well, since it's on the unit circle, we can reference it, uh, the point, based on the angle theta. The x-coordinate is the cosine of theta, and the y-coordinate is the sine of theta. So if I uh, move these into position here, this becomes cosine of theta squared plus sine of theta squared is equal to 1. There is a shortcut way of writing powers of trig functions after you've evaluated them. What they do is they move the square onto the function itself. So you read this as cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta is equal to 1, and more commonly, we usually write the sine first. I don't know why, but we do. So a lot of times you'll just uh, hear people rattle off this identity as sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. And that's the Pythagorean identity, because it comes from the Pythagorean theorem. And that's one of them. There are two others, uh, but these are must know identities right here. Let's go ahead and develop the other two identities. I'm going to start with our basic Pythagorean identity. And then I'm going to divide all three parts by cosine squared of theta. Since I'm dividing by the same quantity, it's still equal. And then what does that result in? Well, sine squared of theta over cosine squared theta can be rewritten as sine theta over cosine theta squared plus next cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta cancels and gives me a 1. And 1 over cosine squared theta simplifies to 1 over cosine theta, that quantity squared. Then I can simplify the insides of the parentheses. So this interior here becomes a tangent. So sine theta over cosine theta is tangent, and it's squared. So I'll put the squared on the tangent, plus 1. And now simplifying 1 over cosine theta, that gives me secant theta. So this is a second 
Pythagorean identity, which I encourage you to memorize, but if you forget it, you can always simply derive it using the original one and dividing by cosine squared of theta. And there's also a third one, and that third one is cotangent squared theta plus 1 is equal to cosecant squared theta. And there's an obvious relationship here. If you take the tangent uh, Pythagorean identity and just turn these trig functions into their co-functions, uh, then you get the same identity. So tangent becomes cotangent squared theta, and then secant squared theta becomes cosecant squared theta. But these are, these are good ones to know. They come up fairly frequently, and I would encourage you to memorize them. Example 6. Find the value of sine squared of 55 degrees plus 1 over secant squared of 55 degrees. Let me write the problem here. This would be a non-calculator question because it works out very nicely, even though we know nothing about 55 degrees. So first, let's leave the sine squared of 55 degrees alone. But what is 1 over secant squared of 55 degrees. The reciprocal of secant is cosine, and it's squared, so we square the cosine. And we get cosine squared of 55 degrees, but that's just the Pythagorean identity, and so that's equal to 1. So one thing I should emphasize in this Pythagorean identity is that the angle has to be the same. If you don't have the same angle, then uh, you can't use the identity. So when it says sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta, it's the same theta. So you have to use the same angle in order to use the Pythagorean identity. Example 7. Find tangent of theta knowing that sine of theta is equal to 2 over 5 and the cosine of theta is negative. So let's use the Pythagorean identity, sine squared of theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. I'm going to plug in what I know about sine, that it is 2 fifths squared plus cosine squared theta equals 1. Two-fifths squared is 4 over 25. Everything else is the same. I want to move the fraction to the right side. That gives me cosine squared theta is equal to 1 minus 4 over 25. Simplifying the fraction, I get cosine squared theta is equal to 21 over 25. And now I want to take the square root of both sides. So I'm going to get the cosine of theta. And now the question is, do I use the plus or the minus? And so you have to go back to the problem. And it says that cosine was negative. So that means this is going to be the negative square root of 21 over 25. So you do have to be cautious and wary of which quadrant uh, the angle is in and use the information given to determine when you take a square root whether or not you should be using the positive or the negative result. Let's simplify this to negative square root of 21 divided by 5. And that's the cosine of theta. This question is asking for tangent of theta. So I'm going to use the identity that is sine theta over cosine theta. The cosine of theta was 2 over 5. The tangent was negative square root of 21 over 5. The little denominators cancel, and that gives me negative 2 over square root of 21, 
Now I rationalize the denominator by multiplying by root 21 over root 21. And that gives me negative 2 root 21 over 21. Let's take a look at another property, the odd and even properties. Now these are the same as they are for any sort of algebraic function uh, that you may have studied in college algebra. So a function f is called even if when you plug in negative x into f, you get just regular f of x. Uh, if that's true for all x in the domain of f, and that's even. And it's called odd if when you plug in negative x into the function, you get the negative result of the function. You get negative f of x. So our primary functions, sine is odd, and cosine is even. Let's do example 8. Determine if tangent of theta is odd or even. So to go about proving this, what you want to uh, learn is what happens when you plug negative theta in to a tangent. Do you get negative tangent theta, or do you get positive tangent theta, or do you get something just completely different? And then use that information to determine if it's odd or even. So to start this, I'm going to change tangent using the quotient identity. And so tangent of negative theta is equal to sine of negative theta over cosine of negative theta. Now, we know that sine is odd. So sine of negative theta can be simplified to negative sine of theta because sine is odd. In the denominator, cosine of negative theta is going to be equal to the cosine of theta because cosine is even. And so the negative on the inside, it just goes away. But what is this equal to? Well, here I have sine over cosine. And there's a negative in front, but sine over cosine is tangent of theta. So we have that tangent of negative theta is equal to negative tangent of theta. That means that tangent is odd. So let's go ahead and give you the other odd functions here. So sine is odd, so is tangent, so is cotangent. And so is the reciprocal of sine, cosecant. And the only even functions are cosine and secant. It would be helpful to memorize these, uh, at least the first two, sine and cosine, and then you can derive the others as needed. Uh, but these will help you get you out of a jam when you have negatives inside the function.